Welcome to this episode of the Nothing Ventured Primer with me, Arish Shah. In these Primer episodes, we explore the insights and backgrounds of our guests to give you a bit of an idea of what they've been up to and how they got involved in the tech and venture ecosystem. Enjoy. This season of Nothing Ventured is sponsored by Odin. Odin helps angels, VCs, and founders to raise and deploy capital seamlessly. You can structure your SPVs and now run your funds, handle capital calls, portfolio management more smoothly and easily in one place. Founders use Odin to raise their entire round in a few clicks by simply sending investors a link and receiving investments immediately. Odin works with over 5,000 investors and over 150 emerging fund managers and angel syndicates globally. Head to joinodin.com to learn more. That's J-O-I-N-O-D-I-N.com. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Nothing Venture Primer with me, Arish Shah. Today in the studio with me, I'm really excited to have Dom and Elliot Chapman. Dom and Elliot are brothers and founders of Chapman Capital, where they acquire and scale a portfolio of boutique agencies. Prior to setting up Chapman Capital, they co-founded Social Chaps, a B2B sales and marketing agency. Dom and uh, Elliot, great to have you in the studio with me. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Amazing. Um, so we're going to jump straight in with a bit of a quick, uh, quick fire round of questions. So I'd love to get, uh, uh, for our audience to get to know you a bit better, what were your first jobs? So my first job, um, I was probably 14 mm -hmm. and I was selling ice creams. Excellent. Uh, selling ice creams at a like a beach cafe kind of thing down where locally where where we live in uh, in Bournemouth or where we were brought up, mm -hmm. um, and I would from nine in the morning until about seven eight at night I'd be serving Mr Whippies. Amazing. Uh, I can think of lots of reason that that is a very good entry point into kind of lead gen and yeah. to be, uh, you know, uh, especially given the sort of weather that we have in the UK. I'm not sure that, uh, you know, everyone always wants a, a, an ice You'll cream. You'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. The Brits are, um, they are loyal. We, we'll Mr. eat Whippy. ice cream in the, in any, the winter. Any day. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I get it. And, and you? The funny thing is when he left, I took on that job. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm two years behind him. Okay. Um, so yeah, exactly the same start, which okay. is funny. Okay, yeah, yeah. so it seems like you've, you've essentially <laughs> followed each other's paths throughout. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a lovely <laughs> thing. We're going to get into that a little bit. Um, and what did you do before, sort of directly before you got into this kind of quasi private equity strategy that you've got going yeah, on at yeah. the moment? So um, I, left, uh, I left college 18, knowing full well that I didn't want to go to university. Mm -hmm. Um, I was quite clear on that. And I had an opportunity alongside um, playing, alongside playing football to um, to coach. Mm -hmm. So I was able to set up a local soccer coaching school. Nice. Uh, again, locally in the in the New Forest and did that for, for three years. We started with obviously one school, doing like an after school club. Mm -hmm. Grew that to more than 10 after school clubs every single day. Um, clubs in the holiday. It was the number one regional uh, soccer school. Amazing. I then got headhunted to do something very similar out in the US. Mm -hmm. um, and at 21 with no commitments, it was a very quick and easy yes. Yeah. Um, so went out and did something pretty similar, but on a sort of on a national scale, mm -hmm. um, which was an incredible experience. I was responsible for about 40 coaches, mm. 650 players, mm -hmm. um, and then came back and was pushed into, not pushed, that sounds harsh, but I was encouraged into the family business, okay. which was um, an IT management consultancy. Interesting. Which is kind of where mine and Dom's journey started started to intertwine because we were sharing an office and yeah. both struggling to, to sell the services of our two separate businesses. Got it. Which is where social chaps was first born. It was like the first version of Social Chaps was born. Um, helped grow that IT management consultancy to uh, five mil a year yeah. and exited. And yeah. that's where Dom and I formally started together. Got it. This season of Nothing Ventured is proudly sponsored by Emerge One. Emerge One provides fractional CFO support to venture backed tech startups and scale ups. They work with businesses from C to Series B that have been backed by some of the UK, US and Europe's best venture capital funds. They provide support from capital allocation and management, KPIs and reporting, fundraising support, financial modeling, investor relations and investor management. 
Come check them out at emergeone.co.uk when you're scaling fast and have need of a CFO. And so, Dom, were you following in, in Elliot's footsteps with the no. coaching or was that a completely <laughs> no, different absolutely journey? No, not. I, um, so I started at Specsavers when I was 18, 19 at the, the HQ. Yeah. Um, and I was in the commercial team to start with. And then they launched a sort of innovation function internally, mm -hmm. um, which I sort of led with a couple of others. Um, so we were responsible for putting on hackathons, nice. bringing partners together, coming up with new ideas um, across the business. Um, so within that time, we launched um, a couple of apps that are still used in store today. And then whilst I was there, I started my first business, which was a design agency. Um, left Specsavers when I was 20 mm -hmm. and then started the design agency full time. Um, and then we actually spanned that design agency into a tech business. Mm -hmm. um, that was a recruitment technology business. So we then decided to raise, raised a sort of seed angel seed rounds, mm. um, built the product, scaled it, um, built a little team out in Bournemouth. Um, and then after three, four years, uh, we were turning a profit, we were profitable, but I was just so burnt out. I just couldn't couldn't run it anymore. Didn't want to raise again. Didn't mm. want any more investors involved. So yeah, know that feeling very well. Done with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, as as a team, we decided to sort of exit, recoup the money, get it back to investors, um, and then move on, um, which was a, a good experience. Um, and I'm still sort of got PTSD from launching a tech business and raising at a young age. Um, I, I have so many feelings there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as, as I've talked about on this podcast and, and kind of on my various uh, platforms, uh, you know, I raised some money in a tech business a couple of years ago, ran out of money earlier this year, had to pump in a bunch of money to kind of clear it up and was expecting kind of HMRC to, to do what they should be doing with R&D tax credits. Didn't happen, isn't going to happen. Yep. So I'm now sat there going, OK, right. So this was a really expensive MBA, yeah. uh, which, yeah. Is, yeah. which is but but in fairness, like I've had a couple of investors say the same thing to me. They go like you, you tried and it didn't work and that's fine. Uh, but essentially you paid and other people paid for you to learn. Like, yep. I mean, that and I think that's that's amazing. Thing. And actually something that you've both touched on which I wasn't aware of and which you know I, th I think we might try and explore a little bit when we when we talk in the main podcast is you know neither of you it sounds like went to university you, you both took an entrepreneurial route very early on in life and I have again strong feelings about university and education in general yep. um, and I think maybe you know understanding kind of the rationale behind you know what I'm not going to go to university or I'm you know I'm, I'm education isn't for me or whatever the reasons are like how you made those decisions to kind of jump um into that entrepreneurial journey because i think certainly here in the uk kind of what we build through the education system is a very very sort of linear pathway into becoming a middle manager like yep. that's what i see university as right like at, 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 as it stands uh and and obviously i and plenty of other kind of you know founder stroke entrepreneur types sit there and bang bang on about how we need better skills training in, in kind of school and, and even in university around sales and like how do you read a balance sheet and what's a PL and you know how, how do you run a business and how do you talk to people and yep. you know all, all that sort of stuff so I think anyway we should talk about that in the in the main podcast because yep. I, yeah, sure, I think for that's sure. super interesting and so uh, what then tricks so it sounds like you did the IT consultancy exited that was that how you then decided to kind of form Chapman Capital yeah, so not not so much Chapman Capital. It, it formed the start of Social Chats, Got it, yeah. um, which is the pre-Chapman Capital. Mm. So Dom and I were were sharing an office in in Bournemouth. Um, I was struggling to grow the IT management consultancy. I was 23, 24 at the time, mm. um, and trying to sell to middle-aged men. Yep, which. Um, was hard, hard, yeah, really hard because you don't have any validation, you don't have the experience, and you're trying to sell IT solutions for sort of hundreds of thousands, you know, minimum. You just don't have the the credibility in the sure. space. So Dom and I were talking, and we had to come up with ways that were creative that would get me and others in our business into the room without them necessarily knowing who I was. Mm. Um, Dom was had a similar issue again, sort of young founder, trying to sell the you know trying to get people in, onto the platform onto his B two B recruitment platform. So we're both facing a similar issue. Um, and Dom, you're probably best place to talk about the 
te- the tech side of it. But we use that as, right, we both got the same issue. Let's try and find a, a solution. A common solution. Yeah, yeah, a common solution. We were sat next to it. We were sharing an office in, in Bournemouth. So it just turned, we didn't realise it was going to go anywhere. There was no incentive to ever um, spin it into an agency. Mm. It was just, let's solve the problem here and now. And it quickly turned into, God, this is actually, it's real good fun working together. Yeah. It's great sort of looking for solutions to certain problems. Um, and thankfully, Dom's got the brain to be able to do it. <laughs> but those are, I mean, those are the best problems or the best businesses, right? Which are, are spun out of an inherent problem that you were facing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both of you are facing together. But like, you know, often founders go out and they kind of look for a problem to solve. Actually, the best problems to solve are ones that you've faced and are facing like on a day-to-day basis, right? Is that is that kind of how you saw it? Yeah, and I guess that was the difference between the previous business, which is like, I want to solve a major issue in recruitment. But yeah thinking about it i was a well, naive recruitment is the issue <laughs> yeah <laughs> recruitment is the issue and also i'd never recruited before so how how, how did i know really yeah, yeah. um i guess it was a fresh look on it but um yeah when we were in the office together we we're re- like i was really struggling to to get in the room with hr directors mm-hmm. hr managers mm-hmm. um and we just built this sort of as a team within within stemx mm-hmm. we built this little system which would sort of pull together data and then automatically build relationships um, and, you know, we plugged it into South Coast Network. And then when we both exited, we were like, right, let's let's do this digital agency. Had no idea what we wanted to sell. But I was like, right, I'll turn it back on then for, for the new. There's something here. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, it was like, I'll turn it on and we'll find new clients for this mm. this business without still realizing that the, the, the system that we built was the business. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then eventually it became the business. And then I guess that's the difference between working on a business where I always say it feels like swimming against the current to, to wither current. Um, and the moment that it sort of clicks. That's clearly a very Bournemouth. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. yeah, yeah, is, yeah. <laughs> brought up by the sea. Yeah, yeah. yeah brought up by the sea. Yeah. Um, and then the moment it all clicked into place, like, you know, that's when we scale pretty quickly at Social Shops. I think we went from three of us to about 22 of us in seven, eight months with yeah. no, no funding. We didn't want to take investment again. Yeah. Didn't want, to, I think, em- I think didn't mo- want to employ anybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I think most founders, like if they've been through the journey, the second time they launch a business, they are often very reluctant to take on any external capital as far as possible, right? Like as they far may as need possible. some seeding, seed funding to get kind of get off the ground. But the problem is the more investors you take on, the more people you're beholden to and the more kind of impetus there is to drive the outcome for them rather than for yourselves, right? I think Dom and I, when we, when we started Social Chaps in that first 12 months, it was so liberating just us two working yeah. together. Um, constantly being on and I, I think we are going to get into this in terms of like working with family and working with brothers mm. or as brothers it was liberating working with somebody who's on the same page and yep. there was no friction it was just so it felt so easy by, by the way that is not normal for family <laughs> businesses as i can attest to like often brothers are not on the same page no, it in felt any way, shape or form, it yeah. felt really really easy yeah, yeah. um just because decision making was you know we're aligned our values are the same yeah. we're on the same like we're on the same mission any issue that we had you know we spent the first 10 15 years of our life literally jumping off sofas onto each other pretending we were in the wwe (laughs) so trying to trying to solve any little issue around not sure what to do with this client it was it was really really straightforward so then to layer in do we take on any external Mm. And that's the way we saw it is external pressure, yeah. not external funding. You can't do, you can't do how you, you can't no. do it how you want to do it. You start yeah. having to do it how they want to do it. Exactly. And, and what do you reckon you would both be doing if you weren't uh, heading up Chapman Capital now? Um, I would be doing something where I'm not working for anybody. Yeah. You know um, that feeling very well as well. I think, yeah. I think Dom and I have both realized that um, we are much better. I'd say on our own. When I say on our own, I mean together. Mm-hmm. So if we weren't doing Chapman Capital, it would be some form of product or it would be something else, but another business them together. Yeah. 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 So I, you, I couldn't you, work for you, you both think you'd still be working together. That's, yeah. Really, yeah, and that's so, super cool. And yeah. the, we've within the, the time of starting Chapman Capital, there's been so many failed ventures together trying to you yeah. know, get things off the ground. We tried a rum brand. We've tried uh, alcoholic iced mm. ice, ice cream or ice sorbet. Mm. Um, you know, there's, plenty of things sports management we've, mm. we've tried so many different things 
um, in the time of that. So, you know, if it wasn't Chapman Capital, it would have been something else. And it's the thing, like, on, on today's show, we're going to talk about a lot about the successes. What people don't or haven't seen is for every minor success we've had, there was four or five failures which is standard, but it's never spoken about. Yeah, it's the entrepreneurial journey. I mean, yeah. like, th- this is the point, right? I think everyone sees the success, no one sees the 10 years yeah. of kind of bleeding <laughs> that goes on. Pain. Before. Absolute, yeah, absolute, like, b- b- pain at, at, at your very core, right? It's not even it's not even surface level pain. It's sort of pain you go to bed with and yeah. wake up with in the morning. So let's talk about Chapman a sec- uh, for a second. So it's kind of a private equity style uh, roll-up business. So what sort of uh, companies do you buy? Where are they based? And... I think importantly, why should the companies that you do buy come to you, uh, especially if they're looking to exit, and what what do you offer them? So the the types of company that we are, or types of companies that we're we're interested in, are essentially and exclusively agencies. Mm-hmm. Um, Define an agency for me. In so your context, a service based business. Mm-hmm. Um, somebody who is so, for example, we've got marketing. Um, agencies, we've got e-com agencies. Mm-hmm. We were talking off air about the, you know, the finance outsourced finance service-based agency, which, you know, you could call it. Well, it's a service-based business. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And we've come from that background. It's what we, it's what we know. With everything that we've done, we have tried to productize and create a SaaS-like business within the service-based space. Um, and there is a there is a market for it. And why should people work with us? Or why I think why do people like having that conversation? If an agency is looking at an exit, they're typically looking either at private equity. Yeah. It's largely private equity in the agency space. <clears throat> and a lot of people don't understand how an agency is run. Agencies are they struggle with cash flow. Mm-hmm. It is a constant hamster wheel to try and win new clients and move away from project-based work into retainer work and you've got to try and get the yeah, split between... feeling severely triggered here but yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it is it, it yeah. is this constant hammering and it is painful yeah and if you speak to any agency owner they would say something similar and i think where we come at it from a, a place where we fully understand that pain we can support you on the finance side of things and we can support you on the the lead gen and sales side of things which typically agencies and agency owners aren't as strong at. Mm-hmm. Agency owners or agencies in general. They're subject matter experts. They, exactly. They know what they're doing, but they don't know how to run they're a typically business better at, often. They're typically better at delivering their service yeah. than all the other stuff. Yeah. So our not our core offering, but what we can say is, listen, you go and look after what you're excellent at. Let us worry about the stuff that you're struggling with. Mm. And we'll really ease that pain. Mm because we've got the track record to be able to do so. Mm. And in two, three years time, rather than selling to, you know, private equity now where they're gonna, you're gonna be employed again, you're gonna be really trying to hit certain numbers, we'll actually go on this growth journey with you. Mm. So that, I think that's probably the biggest value add that we've that we've got right now with agency owners. Yeah, you're ha- hands on as opposed to hands off, which, yeah. which often most private equity are, right? And, and so, I mean, again, just thinking about it sort of, from a technology perspective, are you then putting in kind of processes or technology? Are, are you able to rinse and repeat the same processes and technology into each of the businesses that you work with? Or are you having to go in and kind of understand them as standalone businesses? Or are you able to kind of use the model uh, on it, a repeat basis? It's a bit of both, actually. Like yeah. in terms of the the sales, the sort of the CRM, mm. all of that side of it, most of the businesses don't really have anything in place. Yeah. Um, so Which is that, not a surprise. <laughs> that is just an easy implementation training, you know, three months, they've got CRM, um, we've got a standardized sales process, all the tech in place. Um, I think the, the harder side is the technology around people and managing tasks yeah. and managing delivery. Um, but obviously the beauty is we've got, the view of seven, eight agencies right now um, who are all doing it slightly differently. Um, so, so we can, can borrow from one. We to can the other. borrow and we yeah. can share. Um, and it's not even just the technology. It's like the people process. You know, one one company might do amazing things um, to incentivize. You know, the staff. So we can share that with the other team, mm-hmm. and then they'll go and implement that as well. Um, so yeah, I, I guess it's a bit of both, for sure. The, the sales side of stuff needs to be set up from the start um, because, you know, 
you ask you know where these leads are being stored or where these these prospects are being stored and it's you know it's, it's in their head or just mm. on a notepad somewhere mm. um which l's probably feeling guilty of right now because he still does it well i, I, I mean like even even <laughs> I, I, I would be i'd be really honest right so i implemented hubspot i think you know a few years ago and then never looked at it yeah and it just didn't work for me it wasn't it didn't work for my flow um and then i started using Airtable as a product probably about again a year two years ago and have just been able to build my entire kind of operating system off the back of Airtable. And it just works for me as a yep. CRM, as a, so obviously as lead capture, but also um, to capture the kind of CFOs that are coming into the business, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and I think what a lot of founders don't necessarily appreciate is when you are building a business, you're not building a business, you're building a set of processes. And that's mm -hmm. actually what most people are buying, right? So if you can get the processes to a point where they are scaling and um, uh, are, are easy to be implemented again and again and again, you have a playbook essentially, that's that's what then, you know, someone that's looking to acquire you is, is actually buying, right? They're, they're buying Massively. that scale. And, and obviously the customer. And, and well, the important but. thing around that is if you remove yourself, someone can pick that up 100%. quite easily. And that's the thing about getting those processes right. Which is actually the biggest problem with agencies. And certainly yeah. like in every conversation that I've had is like, okay, how do I extricate myself from the business? Because actually the business and I are so heavily intertwined. Yeah. That, like if someone were to come and acquire it, would they be able to actually do drive the business in the same Absolutely. way that I, that, that I do. So if you were, just as we wrap up, if you think about like two or three ventures that both of you are really excited about, either inside your portfolio or even outside that you're looking at, or that you're like, wow, you know, wish we'd have we'd have been able to kind of get in with them. What, what sort of business or who, who would those be? I think um, one I'm really excited about at the moment is one we signed in August, which is 360 Brands. Mm -hmm. um, they're sort of a D to C e-commerce agency, but the interesting thing about that is we're supporting them in actually bringing in um, other brands under the umbrella. Mm. So kind of uh, they've got their own they've got their own clients, but it's what else can we bring to the table for them? Cool. So we're speaking to a uh, like a luxury clothing brand at the moment. Um, you know, some drinks brands. What can we do to actually buy them and put them under the the umbrella of yeah. 360 brands? Um, and I know the Hut Group have done a similar model, but it just works. It works great. Yeah, that's the typical, it's like the FBA roll-up strategy that, yeah. that's been going on. Well, and I say that at a time where Thrasso looks like it's about to go out of business, but, um, you know, th that was essentially the, uh, you know, the uh, the objective with those with those FBA roll-up businesses, you just buy small kind of uh, Amazon brands and then, you know, obviously leverage or create efficiencies by leveraging kind of marketing across all of them, right? What's interesting is, you know, if you would have asked us six months ago whether that's part of the strategy. Of course it have, wasn't. <laughs> we, exactly. <laughs> but then you start working with, you know, with different, different service-based companies, you go, okay, we could actually start to leverage something else here. Mm. And then all of a sudden you're into potentially acquiring struggling brands mm. because you've got an agency that could in a matter of three months turn it around yeah so it's you know with with everything that we're doing with this portfolio it's this is our overarching strategy however we can't be fixed to that no, if, if something as well exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah and i think it's it's not being too um not being too fixed on well, whilst this is the direction we're heading in, it yeah. doesn't have to be a straight line. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, like, the, the more, there are there are always benefits to being rigid, but there are always benefits to also being flexible, right? So rigidity means that you can just use the same play again and again, but the benefit, because you're not using other people's money, is that you can also take the punts that you want to take, yep. um, which I think is awesome. Uh, Dom, Elliot, really uh, great to have understood a bit more about your backgrounds. Really looking forward to getting into, uh, into it in the main podcast, but for the, for the time being, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very Thank much. You.